Hello, I'm Alec Avdikov, and welcome to the life and times of Frederick the Great. I would once more like to thank you all for the support I am receiving. I have now reached 200 downloads on Podbean, and this is another great milestone for me. I seriously cannot believe that I got as many downloads as the size of a random Midwest high school. I also am now publishing only my eighth episode, and to get that amount of support in that short of a time is incredible. I would also like to say that tiers have now been added to my Patreon, and in the link in the episode description, you can look at what goodies you'll get when you sign up to be a patron. Please do consider donating on Patreon so that I can continue after I reach five hours of content. Already, I am over halfway done with the number of hours left. So, I will reach the time limit, and I implore that you give your support. Now, let's get on to the show. Last episode, I went into depth about the War of the Spanish Succession, because nobody expects the Spanish Succession! I talked about the horrifyingly bloody battles of Blenheim and Madblaque. We also heard that Louis XIV had managed to turn the tide of the war and to secure his grandson to be the king of Spain. He then died a year later, thus becoming the longest reigning monarch in European history. Before we stop talking about Louis XIV forever, uh, let me tell you a quote about that Winston Churchill would eventually write regarding Louis XIV. According to Winston Churchill, during the whole of his life, Louis XIV was the curse and pest of Europe. No worse enemy of human freedom has ever appeared in the trappings of polite civilization, insatiable appetite, cold, calculating ruthlessness, monumental conceit, presented themselves armed with fires and sword, veneer of culture, and good manners, of brilliant ceremonies, and elaborate etiquette only adds to a heightening effect to the villainy of his life story. Better the barbarian conquerors of antiquity, primordial figures of the abyss, than this high-heeled, be periwigged dandy, strutting amid the bows and scrapes of mistresses and confessors to torment his age, petty and mediocre, in all except his lusts and power, the Sun King disturbed and harried mankind during more than 50 years of arrogant pomp. Dang, Winnie. He was bad, but was he really that bad? Anyway, that's what happens when the French and British keep fighting for over 400 years. Now, let us press on to why I am discussing the Great Northern War. The escapades of the Swedish Empire is not only a good story to listen to as you're driving your way to work, but it is also an important to the story of Frederick the Great. The military experience that his father would receive would help him decide that he would want to avoid war instead of having the same ambitions of conquering vast territories in Europe as Charles XII had. The Great Northern War also saw the rise of Russia, to become a great European power under Peter the Great, and the slow decline of Sweden to a secondary power. To use a brilliant analogy that Tan Carlin used to describe Japan's empire in World War II, we will soon watch the supernova of the Swedish Empire, a massive explosion that will shock everything that surrounds it. This supernova will start when we find a 14-year-old rise to become the king of Sweden. What is it with early modern Europe and children rulers? I mean, do you remember what you were doing when you were 14? I certainly don't want to. Anyway, this child became known as Karl XII of Sweden, or Karolos Rex, as in the Samadon song. The rulers of Denmark, Poland, and Russia were licking their lips when they saw that they had a chance to conquer and partition up the lands of the Swedish Empire once the weak boy would become king. After all, they listened to the Bible quote, Woe to thee, O land, when thy king is a child. 
and base their judgment upon the weakness of a child ruler that was certainly going to fold over like a house of cards. I'm sure they had the idea that Hitler had when he invaded the Soviet Union, when he said, we have only to kick in the door and the whole rotten structure will come crashing down. Denmark wanted Scania, a province that Sweden took from Denmark earlier in the 1600s. Poland wanted Livonia, now Latvia, so that the then king of Poland, Augustus the Strong, could become a hereditary king rather than ele an elected king. By the way, Polish elections to become king were a lot like the Holy Roman Empire. The people did not elect their king, but the nobles did. And finally, Russia wanted to have Ingria and Estonia so that they could gain a link to the Baltic Sea. See, Peter the Great was a bit like the Great Elector. He had seen how rich the Dutch had become through trade and wanted in on the action. He wanted Russia to, to become a much more Western country. The reforms he made touched the army, the navy, and even the nobility. In fact, the nobles were not allowed to have beards, and they were taxed if they had beards. This tax was imaginatively called the beard tax. Also, like the great elector, he brought in many foreign experts to help run Russia because the best educated people were outside his realm. However, unlike the great elector, Peter the Great was a giant of a man. Imagine one day you're walking down the street and you see a behemoth of a man with dark hair and a mustache yelling at you in Russian. I would bravely run away just like brave Sir Robin. But yeah, that was Peter the Great. He was six foot nine at a time when the average height in Europe was five foot five. Peter the Great was another child ruler when he ascended to become Tsar in 1682 when he was 10 years old. Could you imagine if this was how politics were today? You'd have some pompous 16 year old believing that he was the messenger of God's word on earth to rule people. It's amazing we've made it this far as a species. Peter the Great seized ruling power when his mother died in 1694, when Peter was 22 years old. He then continued to make war with the Ottoman Turks. This war began in 1686 and kept dragging on as Charles XII became king of Sweden in the freezing winter of 1697. Before the Russians made peace, however, Peter's allies attacked Sweden. However, Charles was young and full of energy, so he moved his army into Holstein and attacked the Danish army, and totally crushed them. With Denmark, Denmark humiliated, they signed the Treaty of Travendal, the same day that Peter declared war on Sweden in 1700. It seemed like Peter was facing a much more daunting enemy than he had first thought. Here's what Peter the Great, a biography by Lindsay Hughes, has to say about Charles XII. Peter the was facing a much more formidable enemy than he imagined. Far from being a walkover, Sweden's boy king proved to be even more single-minded to war than even Peter himself. Even simpler in his tastes and more indifferent to discomfort. Indeed, from 1700 to his death in 1780, he barely returned to the Swedish mainland, she continues. Charles the Great's love, some would say obsession, was his army, which was regarded the best in the world. Its soldiers created it with almost superhuman qualities. Peter mobilized a grand army to face off against the Swedes in the port of Narva in what is today Estonia in the summer and would not arrive until late fall, thanks to horrible Russian roads and the fall mud known as the Rasputitsa. Then, in winter, King Charles XII of Sweden attacked the Russians, who outnumbered him four to one. The warrior king slashed through the Russian lines, and Narva would be the battle that put King Charles's name in history when they trounced the Russians. Charles XII then moved into Poland, where Augustus the Strong was king. Fun fact about Augustus the Strong. His armies were anything but. 
Charles was outnumbered battle after battle and won time and time again against the Poles. He even took the great Polish city of Krakow without firing a shot. While Charles was attacking Poland, Peter attacked the Swedes in Ingria and founded a city on the mouth of the river Neva. The construction of this city would cost the lives of tens of thousands of people. This city would be known as Petersburg, later Sankt Petersburg. The building of this city was also paired with the construction of a grand fortress called the Peter and Paul Fortress on an island in the Baltic Sea next to Petersburg. The Swedes rammed their heads against the fortress time and time again, but could not take it. The Swedish army was losing too many men, and their supply situation was dire. So, instead of fighting a defensive war to hold what Charles had already gained, Charles would take the fight to the Russians and began to march to invade Russia on New Year's Day in 1708 and began in Poland near Warsaw. Charles's generals believed that he was insane. His armies were stretched so thin as it was. How could he possibly hope to succeed? Charles reasoned that he could once again live off the land and as he had done in other campaigns and he would force battle with the Russians and once again miraculously win with his modern army as he had done at Narva. However, when the Swedes began marching, Peter the Great's army kept retreating and burning the land behind them. The Swedes managed to win a bitter fight against the Russians while crossing a river at the Battle of Holovchin in July 1708. However, the Swedish army was exhausted after the fight, and they did not advance for another 30 days. The farther the Swedes advanced, the more men they lost, and the farther their supply lines got, and the winter was getting closer. Charles then turned south to advance upon the breadbasket of the Russian Empire, Ukraine. Charles knew two things about Ukraine. One, there's a lot of food there, and two, the Cossacks in Ukraine wanted to rebel. However, Peter the Great had a plan. Peter said, if anyone brings the enemy food, even for cash, that person shall be hanged. Also, anyone who knows of such activities but says nothing will be hanged. Also, those villages from which the food is given will be burned. This would be a time of immense starvation and suffering for the people of Russia. The Swedish army would get basically no food to support them. The majority of the Cossacks that were expected to rebel stayed loyal to Russia, and the 30,000 men that Charles was promised by the hetman or chief of the Cossacks did not arrive. Instead, only 1,500 of those 30,000 arrived. Then, you know the thing that happens to invading Ru in armies in Russia. Ta-ha, dumb Hitler and Napoleon for invading Russia in the winter. Durr. Okay, here's a rant session. Both Napoleon and Hitler's invasions began in June, and most of their losses happened in the, win in the summer because of poor supply. See, amateurs talk about tactics, but professionals talk about logistics. My goodness, nobody invaded Russia in the winter, you fart. Sorry about that. I felt it needed to be said. So, therefore, hundreds would freeze to death in the disastrous invasion of Russia. Charles XII was left with a mere shadow of the great Swedish army that with only 20,000 surviving the winter. Then Charles chose the bold move to go deeper into Russia instead of cutting his losses like, you know, a sane person would do after almost freezing to death in Russia. So Charles put the small Ukrainian town of Poltava under siege in May 1709. Peter the Great himself went to the battlefield of Poltava with a huge force of 90,000 men. On July 8th, 1709, history was set for an extraordinary battle that would decide the fate of the Swedish Empire. Would Charles hold on to his glorious empire that he conquered for himself? Let's find out. <laughs>
The battlefield had the Russians guarding the woods to the left and right of a strong position of redoubts. Instead of being sensible, Charles would attack the Russian bear of 90,000 men with his 20,000 men. What the heck, Charles? You have the best army on earth, and yet you want to waste it on a pointless attack? Okay, Chuck. Okay. Anyway, the battle began as the Swedes rapidly advanced in the center against the Russian redoubts, and the attack met with surprising success. The Swedish cavalry caused havoc against the Russians, and all looked good until someone said halt. Nobody knows why the order was given to halt. They could have been mistakenly heard in the chaos of battle. However, I want to believe that some Swedish officer yelled to stop because he was like, Hey, my shoes are untied. Anyway, this stopped any progress the tiny Swedish army was making, and the Russians slaughtered the Swedish army nearly down to the man. Charles was put on a horse by an officer, and two seconds later, a Russian killed that very officer that put him on the horse. Charles and some 1,500 of his fastest horse troops barely managed to retreat from the battlefield to the Ottoman Empire. The Battle of Poltava decided the war from there on out. Charles would be a guest of the Ottoman Empire f until 1714, or for five years. Side note, he was probably one of the worst house guests that Turkey ever had. Charles stayed in a town called Bender as he watched his entire empire collapse all at once. His land that he conquered in Poland was lost. He lost Estonia and Livonia. Denmark was once again at war with Sweden. You may ask, but what was Prussia doing in all of this? Now hold your britches, let me get there. Prussia had been cautiously looking at the north for a while now, and Frederick I declared armed neutrality until he died in February 1713. His son, Frederick Wilhelm, who we will talk about the next episode, then became king in Prussia. Prussia had been embroiled in the War of Spanish Succession, and now that the war was ending, it could turn its attention north against Swedish Pomerania, a territory that even the Great Elector failed to keep. The Prussians openly sided against Sweden in 1714, and took the port of Stettin and the rest of Swedish Pomerania with the help of Russian and Danish armies. The war continued for a few more years, but everyone knew that Sweden's jig was up. Here's what the rise of Brandenburg Prussia by Margaret Shannon has to say about the end of the war. The Allies could not agree on an invasion of Sweden, and after Charles XII's mysterious death in 1718, the Prussian king detached himself from Russia with British persuasion and followed Hanover into making peace with Sweden. By the Treaty of Stockholm in 1720, Frederick Wilhelm agreed to pay two million dollars for Western Pomerania as far as the River Pena, including the port uh, of Stettin and the islands of Usedom and Volin. Despite failing in his bid for the whole province, his reputation was much enhanced by gaining what the great elector had tried but failed to win. Oh yeah, the British also got involved in the war, but their contribution was their navy, and this is a podcast about Prussia, so we don't really care about the navy. Anyway, the Treaty of Neustadt between Russia and Sweden finally ended the 21-year-long conflict. This cemented the fall of Sweden and the rise of Russia on the European stage. Here's what Gavrila Golovkin a Russian count had to say about Peter the Great in the celebration of the Treaty of Neustadt. He has brought us out of the darkness of ignorance onto the stage of glory before the eyes of the world, and, as it were, transformed us from non-existence into being, bringing us into the society of nations. Russia has truly entered our story with a bang. Peter the Great would eventually die just three years later, in 1725, aged only 52. He deserves a much more grander story than I have given him, but sadly, that is all the time I can spend on him. After all, we must move back to Prussia next week 
to see the rise of young Frederick Wilhelm I of Prussia, the father of the king, Frederick the Great. Seriously, I am so excited to start on King Frederick the Great's life. This week, since we focus so much on Russia, I believe I shall conclude in Russian. Therefore, I say to you, Sivo Haroshiva.